turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18 this morning. You can find it on your pew Bible on page 878 as we conclude chapter 18 of the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 31. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, will be mocked and shamefully treated, spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front of him rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. When he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, Give praise to God. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. You may be seated. Several years ago, there was a video, it was a documentary, really, on Christ and Jesus being the truth. And it was called the Truth Project. I believe it was put out by Focus on the Family. And in this video series, they would interview prophets, uh, excuse me, not prophets, professors, let me say that, (laughs) that would be bad, professors and scholars from various leading institutions around the country, most of which had PhDs, sometimes multiple PhDs in religious studies. They were seemingly the brightest of the bright. But in this video series, they had another person that they interviewed that would make frequent appearances. And this person was a 13-year-old boy named Kyle. And Kyle was born with cerebral palsy, which gave him limited physical abilities. But that which he lacked physically, he made up mentally. Kyle was a very brilliant young man and extremely articulate And the more that he would speak in this video series, the more you would see that despite his disability, this young man got it, oftentimes better than the professors and the scholars. In fact, the contrast between the quote-unquote doctors and Kyle was very stark. And the difference was that Kyle had faith in God, not an unintelligent faith, a very intelligent faith. And yet, it came from a simple trust and belief in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, that which the others, oftentimes in the interview, did not have. And it demonstrates that if you do not begin with God, if you do not have faith in Him, then you have no foundation for knowledge, for understanding, and for wisdom. As the Scriptures would say, it does not matter how Smart you may be, it does not matter how many degrees you have or letters following your name. Psalm 53 is still true. The fool says in his heart that there is no God. Or even as we saw in our call to worship this morning, only in your light do we see light. And so this 13-year-old boy with cerebral palsy demonstrated that the others were mere fools, and oftentimes without light. And perhaps you know others like Kyle, those that perhaps have a very basic education or are hindered in other ways, and yet their faith, and as a result, their wisdom puts others, maybe even yourself, to shame. 
And that is what I believe we have in our passage this morning. We have a blind man, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar that sees while everyone else does not see. He sees what everybody else misses, even what the disciples failed to see. And so this passage asks that question, even though we do see, do we see? Has God given us the eyes of faith to see him as he truly is? And we'll see that this morning in two points, seeing and yet not believing, and then second, not seeing, yet believing. First, seeing, yet not believing. As we start, I want to take us back a little bit to Luke chapter 9. You can turn there if you want to, and I think this is helpful because sometimes we don't want to miss the forest for the trees as we make our way through the gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 18, we have a very crucial portion of the gospel of Luke. It is this time when Jesus asks, who do the crowds say that I am? And the disciples give the answer, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets of old, has risen. And then Jesus asks that crucial question, but who do you say that I am? And Peter rightfully answers, the, the Christ, the, the Christ, the Son of God. This really is a turning point in the ministry of Jesus and the gospel of Luke. Many commentators would even say this is the hinge upon which the gospel turns, where everything changes. As if Jesus was waiting for this moment, this light bulb moment in the life of his disciples, this eureka moment. And we know from the gospel of Matthew that Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but this has been given to you from the Father who is in heaven. So once they understand who Jesus is, that he is truly the Messiah, notice what takes place next. Well, Jesus goes on to tell them in verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed on the third day, and therefore be raised. So, Jesus tells them, yes, I am the Messiah, and this is what the Messiah has come to do. He's come to suffer and to die. And the disciples do not understand this. This does not compute for them. In fact, you know that Peter will go as far as to say, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. And you remember, Jesus needs to rebuke Peter because he does not know what he is talking about. Why do I say that? Well, as we turn back to Luke chapter 18, we see the very same thing in our passage this morning. In fact, perhaps you have a Bible that has an, a subtitle over the various sections within the chapter, and in your title there, it says, Jesus foretells his death a third time. Now, these inscriptions, these subtitles, are not part of the original inspired text, but nevertheless, they are helpful, because this is the third time now that Jesus is bringing up his death. The first time they missed it, the second time they missed it, and what we see here is the third time they'll miss it yet again, because as Jesus is nearing the end, and that is really where we're coming to in the gospel of Luke, we are nearing the end of Jesus' physical life. Jesus is trying to tell them what is going to take place. He is telling them as we make our way to Jerusalem, now just a few miles away, as we see that they come to Jericho, would have been about 12 miles from Jerusalem. Jesus is saying to his disciples, we are headed to Jerusalem, and you know what's going to happen there, right? It would be similar if you as a parent would tell your child, son, daughter, we are going to the doctor this week. And you know what's going to happen when we go to the doctor. You are going to get a shot, and it is going to be unpleasant for you as well as for me. 
But you tell them this, or, or maybe you're one of those parents that don't tell them that. You just do the surprise attack. But I think most of you tell them that so that they're not caught unaware. And that is somewhat similar to what Jesus is trying to do, is trying to warn them so that they will not be caught unaware. But it is something that they should have known because this is not something that is new. Rather, this was something that was foretold. In fact, Jesus says that, doesn't he? We are going to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished or will be fulfilled. And we know that the Old Testament Scriptures are not quiet on this. The most famous of which is Isaiah. And you have in Isaiah the servant songs, which give a clear indication of who the Messiah will be and what He has come to do, what function He will perform. And we read things like this in these servant songs. Isaiah 50, verse 6. I'll give my back to those who will strike, and my cheek to those who will pull out the beard. I will not hide my face from disgrace and from spitting. And then from Isaiah 52 and verse 14, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance. And then from Isaiah 53, which gives it in no uncertain terms, surely he has bore our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. For he is pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. See, the disciples would not have been unaware of these passages. And yet the connection was not made, even though Isaiah has laid it out so clearly for them. But even if they missed Isaiah, Jesus tells them, doesn't he, what is going to take place as they come to Jerusalem. He says in verse 32, he'll be delivered up to the Gentiles, will be mocked, shamefully treated, spit upon, and after flogging, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. This is essentially a play-by-play, -play, isn't it, of what will take place on Thursday and Friday of Passion Week. And yet, notice what happens, verse 34, but they understood none of these things. It went right over their head. They understood what was being said, but it did not connect. It's kind of like when two people in a certain profession are talking, and you're not a part of that profession, be it lawyers or maybe accountants or, or techie people or sometimes even musicians. You go, I know they're speaking English, but it is a language unto itself, right? Well, this was not a matter of intelligence or a communication limitation. This was a spiritual matter. The disciples were spiritually hindered from getting it. It was hidden from them. In fact, it says this. This saying was hidden from them. This was a divine hiding. And in fact, we would say they would not understand it until Jesus would rise again from the dead, until the Lord would reveal it to them. And yet at the same time, Luke goes on to say, but they did not grasp, but was said. Luke puts a portion of the blame on the disciples. They did not know what he was talking about, yet they should have because of what the prophets had said and because of what Jesus said. And yet, in the end, they were clueless. This is one of those verses where we see the divine sovereignty and human responsibility coming together. And they do come together. Oftentimes we don't always know how they come together. Not that it's a contradiction, but oftentimes it's above our comprehension. And yet, before we say to the disciples, how, how dull, how many times does Jesus have to say it? One time, two times, three times, you still don't get it? How often are we blind in a similar way? In theology, in the Christian life, in our own personal sins, and oftentimes when those things are revealed to us, we go, how did I, how did I miss that? How did I not see that for so long? How was that hidden from me? And it demonstrates, doesn't it, that seeing is not always believing, is it? And that is what I think makes this second portion of our passage this morning so fascinating and interesting and insightful. 
Because we see, second then, this one that does not see and yet believes. And that is what takes place right after Jesus foretells what is going to take place in Jerusalem. It says they were on their way to Jericho, and a blind man was sitting along the roadside. And we know from the other Gospels, Luke does not give his name, but we know from the other Gospels this was Bartimaeus. And we know from the Gospel of Luke and the other Gospels that to have a physical disability in the first century was not only a social and physical limit, limitation and disability, but also a spiritual one as well. That there was no way to provide for yourself. There was no way to get a job, as it were. You were destined to live a life of poverty. And so this man was begging, sitting along the roadside, waiting for others to take pity upon him. And in many ways, he would have been seen as a non-desirable, a person that would have been easily overlooked, destined to live a long, lonely life, a poverty-ridden life outside of Jericho. And yet, we see something that takes place on this day as Jesus of Nazareth passes by. We don't get all of the backstory, do we? But we know that this blind beggar, Bartimaeus, obviously had some knowledge of who Jesus was. And perhaps uh, as he sat along the road, he heard the stories of those that had witnessed Jesus' miracles or heard of Jesus' teaching. And as a result, Bartimaeus had heard about this one named Jesus. And yet, he could not investigate these things on his own, could he? He could not just look up and see. He could not just go and find out Jesus and so as he hears that this crowd is making a, a murmur and he's wondering what's taking place, he, he asks them and they say, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so what does Bartimaeus do? Well, he begins to cry out. Why does he begin to cry out? Well, he's hoping to hear a response so that he can locate Jesus. Children, this is perhaps like something that you did this summer when you were in the pool and you play that pool game, Marco Polo, right? You know the game. You keep your eyes closed and you yell out, Marco, because why? Well, your eyes are supposed to be closed. You're not supposed to peek. And the other person is to cry out, Polo, so that you know where they are and you try to locate them by your ears because you cannot use your eyes. And so too here with Bartimaeus, he is crying out, but he's not crying out Marco, right? He's crying out the name Jesus. But you notice he's even more specific than that. Notice what he says, Jesus, son of David. This man knew who Jesus was. And this man was not just a teacher. He was not just a healer. But this was the son of David. And you know that that title was used as a messianic term. That title was a weighty title. It was a weighty term. That is saying this is the king. This is the one that the prophets have foretold about. This is the one that is going to take the reign, that is going to sit on the throne of David. We know that in just a few days as Jesus enters into Jerusalem on a full, on a colt, the crowds will sing out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord on Palm Sunday. That too was reserved only for a king. But isn't it interesting that here, blind Bartimaeus is doing it long before the crowds were doing it is doing it long before others realize or recognize who he is. That he is seeing something that the rest have not seen, at least not enough to call it out and call it out publicly for all to hear that this is the one that has come in the flesh. This is the one that has come to Jericho, that has come right to the place where I am. And Bartimaeus knows it. We'd even say Bartimaeus quote-unquote, sees it, doesn't he? 
And again, you can't help but see the paradox of these two passages being put side by side. That Jesus on the way is telling his disciples, this is what the prophet said. This is what's going to happen. And yet they don't get it. And yet there is this blind man not being told, not being taught, disadvantaged in every way, and yet he is believing. The disciples could see. Bartimaeus could not. The disciples could see the the miracles. This man did not and could not. The disciples could read the Scriptures. This man could not read the Scriptures for himself, and yet it's this man, the blind guy, that gets it right, doesn't he? And they do not. The irony runs deep, doesn't it? But I think it demonstrates a biblical principle. And that biblical principle is this, that there is something that is greater than sight, and that is faith. And that is what the author of Hebrews truly says, doesn't he? That faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so for us to have faith, we have to have faith in that which is not seen, that which we can't physically look upon with our very own eyes. And that is important for us to know, and it's important for us to understand, isn't it? Because there is this idea out there is that if we just could demonstrate, if we could just have more evidence for why Christianity is true, then more people would believe. If God would just manifest himself to humanity, then there would be no doubt. If he just wrote it in the skies, right? Well, what does Psalm 19 say? The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims his handiwork. Day to day they pour out speech. Night by night they reveal knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there no words where his voice is not heard. In other words, the psalmist says creation displays the glory of God 24-7. And yet still, mankind does not believe. Well, yeah, that's true, but if, if God would just rend the heavens and come down, no, what does John 1.10 say? He, that is Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and yet his own people did not receive him. Do you hear what the Scriptures say? If God has made himself known, in general revelation, that of creation, and special revelation, that of Christ, and yet people still do not believe there is no amount of physical evidence that will ever do. As Francis Schaeffer once put it, he is there and he is not silent. That there is plenty of proof, there's plenty of ways for people to believe, but they still do not. Why? Because it takes faith, doesn't it? And faith is the conviction of that which is unseen, that which is spiritual. But that doesn't mean that it's not real, does it? No, when we say that we are to see the spiritual, it is a reality that is more real than the hand that is in front of my face. And what we see in this passage so beautifully is this man had it. He had not sight, but he had a greater sight of the greater reality that comes by faith. See, Bartimaeus had the faith of the fathers before him, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and others. What does the author of Hebrews say? That they saw the promises far off and yet believed in them, as if they had them, as if they grasped them themselves, because that's how firmly they held to them by faith. Beloved, is that your faith this day? Do you have the faith of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and that of Bartimaeus, that you see spiritual realities and you hold on to those spiritual realities greater than you hold on to the realities of this life? Because even though we have not seen the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning our eyes have not laid hold upon Him or seen Him physically, even though we are not witnesses to his work and to his miracle and to his teachings, even though we weren't there for his death and for his resurrection, our eyes still behold him, but behold him 
by faith. And that's what it means to believe these realities, is to believe them more than the realities of what we can see and that which we can hear. That Christ should be more real to you than I am standing in front of you. That you should believe him more than you believe and trust your own eyes to see and your own ears to hear. See, faith doesn't take eyes to see. It takes a heart to believe and to trust. And that is the difference, isn't it? See, the crowd and the Pharisees had the eyes, but they had not the heart. But Bartimaeus had not the eyes, but he had the heart to believe and to trust. And I ask you, which is greater? I'd even ask you, actually, who is the disabled one in this passage? Who is the one that's truly blind? It's those that could see, but yet did not see Christ as Bartimaeus saw him. Because as Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Do you notice that? They can see, but they can't see. Whereas he'll go on to say, Jesus will say in John 20, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. And so do you have the eyes to see? Do you have the ears to hear? And Jesus is calling all of us to that type of faith this day. And when I say all of us, I say that to those that have not put their faith in Christ yet, as well as those that have. But that is how we have greater faith, is to see him in greater ways, to have Christ manifested before us again and again, for us to see realities from this spiritual reality, to see life from the kingdom of God in no other way. And if that is true of you, then you are blessed. And this comes by regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, and by that alone. It comes from hearing the Word of God. That's what it says, doesn't it? And in Scripture, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Notice it doesn't come by necessarily seeing. It comes by hearing because through hearing we can believe and we can trust what it is that Jesus has said, what He has done, and as a result, we do see with these new spiritual eyes. What this passage is calling us to is to all of us to have an encounter with the living God. No, we cannot physically see Jesus, but spiritually, we must. We must. And I think Bartimaeus shows us how, doesn't he? Do you notice what he cries out for? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He doesn't cry out for merit. He doesn't cry out for justice. He cries out for mercy. It's very similar, isn't it, to the tax collector in verse 13 when it says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Or God be merciful to me, the sinner. So too, Bartimaeus cries out for mercy. It's the same thing that the rich young ruler should have cried out for but didn't. And so you see with these stories being put together with the blind, or the uh, rich young ruler and blind Bartimaeus, you have real life examples of the Pharisee and the tax collector right here at the end of chapter 18. And so Luke is showing us how to enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and those that will not, those that are included and those that are excluded, and the entryway into the kingdom of God is always by mercy. Always crying out for mercy. Not trying to look for something in yourself, but only looking to what God will provide, which is his mercy to us as sinners. And that is exactly what Bartimaeus does. I love this. Do you notice this? It says that he, he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This isn't a, a quiet plea, is it? This is a crying out. In fact, he's crying out so much, so loudly, that a sense he becomes a nuisance to those that are around him. It says those that were in front of him rebuked him and told him to be silent. In other words, they were saying, Bartimaeus, quiet, settle down, go back to what you were doing before. Jesus doesn't have time for you. But you notice what it says, and I love this. It says, but he cried out, 
all the more. He became louder, more incessant. He cried out with greater vigor. He would not be deterred. And this truly relates to our faith, doesn't it? If you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the world will try to tell you, hey, keep that down. Just, just be quiet about it. You can have your faith, but, you know, don't, don't disturb others by it. Stay silent. Be quiet. They might even try to shame you and say, well, you, you don't really believe that, do you? No, but if you know that your greatest need is for mercy, your greatest need is for grace, and that mercy and grace can only be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. That just has you to cry out all the more, isn't it? You cannot be deterred because your spiritual eyes have been opened. You cannot unsee what you have seen in Christ. Your heart and soul has found out what it is looking for. And like Jesus says to the Pharisees as he enters into Jerusalem and they try to tell Jesus, hey, quiet your, your disciples down. Hush the crowd. You remember what Jesus is in return. If they are silent, the very stones will cry out. See, if you've been given the new heart in Christ, if you've been given what Ezekiel 36 talks about, if you've been given a new heart, a new spirit, and has removed the heart of stone and given you a heart of flesh, then you must cry out. You must Praise God. That's why I hope we're, we're ever singing that much louder. We're growing in our singing. We're growing in our praise because once we've seen him, we can't help but cry out to him in praise, in worship of mercy, of grace that only he can give. And what happens when we do this? Well, we see from this passage, Bartimaeus' faith is rewarded in verse uh, 40, it says, Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And he came near and he asked him, what do you want me to do? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. Isn't it interesting that the Lord always hears the cry for mercy? That Christ always hears that cry when we come to him in that attitude, with that heart desire for him. And not only does he hear, but he answers. Just as he answered Bartimaeus and gave him that which he was longing for, that which he was requesting, that he would recover his sight. And Jesus said to him, again, with a word, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And there is no testimony throughout Scripture of anyone having their sight healed except for when the Messiah comes. And this is exactly what we see in Isaiah 35. When God comes in salvation, what will happen? That the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped and the lame man shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. You see how these physical healings demonstrate the, the greater healing that is needed, the healing that all of us need, that is the salvation of our souls through the forgiveness of sins. It's where we're being brought from death into life. Bartimaeus' confidence and, and faith in Christ accomplished this, and the Lord indeed answers and hears his request. And as a result, what takes place? Well, his faith becomes sight, doesn't it? His eyes are, are opened. He sees the face of his Savior. In fact, this is perhaps the, the first vision that he's ever given, is to be able to see the face of Christ. And what a blessing that truly is. And you see the connection, don't you, my friends, that if we have the eyes to see, if we're given the eyes of faith, of who the Savior is and what He has done, that those eyes of faith one day will also behold Christ 
And indeed, that is what we are looking for, that is what we are longing for, and that is what is taking place as we continue to grow in faith. We are seeing more and more of Christ, that we are being made alive. We're seeing a spiritual reality that is a greater reality than this reality. It's a true reality. It's a pure reality. It's given to us by God through His Holy Spirit. It's similar, again, to those that are severely colorblind, and you see them put on these glasses that help them to see color sometimes for the first time, and as they look out through those glasses, they see the world. They see the same world, but they see the world in a totally different perspective, from a brand new perspective. They see the world as it actually is, the way that the Lord has made it. And the same thing happens to us when we're born again, We see all things new. We see the world from God's perspective, the way that He has made it. And that takes place by first, 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 seeing the face of our Savior. Understanding who Christ is, just like Bartimaeus did. And therefore, as a result, his eyes were open, so too with us. And so, let me ask you this morning, have you seen your Savior? And do you see him now? Again, not from a physical form or a mental image that is made in your mind. Rather, do you see him with the eyes of your heart that trust and believe and love him? That love him with a love that is given to you by him. That we love him because he first loved us. That is why this morning I wanted us to, to read that confession of faith from 1 John 1.3. I want you to look at it once again, and I want you to look at it from this perspective. Oftentimes we, we read these words, and we think this is the Apostle John talking about what he has seen and what he has touched, right? And that is true. That is the testimony of the apostles. But I think it goes beyond that. When we have given the eyes, then it's not just the Apostle John. It's not just the Apostles. It's not just the Scripture. But we ourselves can say the very same thing that John says, that that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the Word of life, this life, our life, was made manifest and we have seen it, and therefore we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was from the Father, which was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Do you see what John is saying? When you have the eyes to see, when you've heard, you've laid hold a manifest of Christ who is your life, And then that becomes your proclamation. That becomes our testimony, isn't it? That is who we proclaim to this world, to others that have not been given sight like we have. But we point to the one that can give them sight, which is Christ. And so if you do see this morning, what will take place? Well, you'll see more of Christ, won't you? Again and again, Lord's day after Lord's day. Until one day we have the most glorious Lord's Day where our faith will be sight. One day we will open our physical eyes and see Christ. We'll be face to face with our Lord, either in in glory or when he comes from the clouds. And what a day it will be. And truly when Jesus says, blessed are those that believe and yet not have seen, does not mean that you won't see No, one day you will see physically. That is our hope. That's our joy. That's our confidence. That's been the hope of the believers throughout the centuries. You remember Job saying this in Job 19. For I know, Job says, that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he'll stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in the flesh, I shall see God. Believer, is that your hope and trust as well? Bartimaeus got to experience that day, what we'll all be able to get to experience one day very soon, seeing Jesus in the flesh with our very own eyes, given to those that have the eyes of faith to see Christ even now. And together we'll be made 
the completed bride of Christ. And in that day, we'll no longer have to cry out for mercy, will we? We'll just cry out in praise and in worship of God. What a day. What a day it'll be. And so don't miss it. All are invited to that wedding day, to that wedding feast of the land, given for all that have ears to hear and eyes to see, to those that walk by faith and not by sight. Well, join me in prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, indeed, we desire to walk by faith and not by sight. And so, Lord, would we, as we even close our eyes, and as we close our eyes, both in private and corporate prayer, Lord, would it open a world unseen, sometimes a world unknown to the rest of the world. But yet, Lord, we see it with greater vision, a greater glory than anything that we can see on this earth. That that vision is more beautiful than the best of sunsets, more beautiful than the best of landscapes. For it is the vision of our Lord and Savior, the one that has come to redeem, the one that has come to save. Lord, would we have those eyes to see even this day? And would our sight grow stronger? Would we gain greater and greater clarity? Would we see the face of our Savior that much more beautiful than we even do now until we would see him face to face? Until that day, O oh Lord, help us increase our faith. Let us, through the Word of God, grow in that faith and as a result, grow in that vision for you. We pray this all in Christ, our Savior's name. Amen.